Shh. Can you hear that? It's the sound of the holidays. Yep, they're coming. Actually, you might even say they're already here. Everyone with a product business knows that this right here, right now, is the prime opportunity to gain some traction in your business and generate significant revenue. And Mina and I, we want that for you. Okay. We want that for you. And that's why we put together the product boss's guide to getting holiday ready checklist. We call it a checklist, but it's so much more than that. It's your crash course for getting your business holiday ready so that you can have an amazing Q4, right? That's quarter four. Now we've packed it full of checklists, planners, tips, resources, and our very best advice for making sure you're ready and prepared for a successful holiday season in your business and into the new year. And my friend, the best news is it's yours for free, totally free. So consider it a holiday gift from us. Just head over to theproductboss.com slash holiday ready. That's theproductboss.com slash holiday ready to grab your getting holiday ready checklist and get ready to sell your way through the holidays. Welcome to the Product Boss Podcast, where we're dedicated to helping product-based business owners turn into revenue-generating, successful, happy product bosses. I'm Jacqueline Snyder. And I'm Nina kunlo Together through digital courses, coaching, and masterminds, we've helped over 50,000 students from startup to multi-million dollar businesses scale their sales while blending in their dream life. It gets lonely out there in the product business world. We fully believe a business shouldn't be built alone. There's room at the top for all of us. So let's get scrappy and creative together, Product Boss, to be profitable, make more sales, and grow your visibility. Are you ready? Let's dive in. Hello, friends, and welcome back. Now, this is going to be a really fun and special episode, something we've never actually done before. And this is a keynote training that we gave at our Product Boss Mastermind Retreat. This is just one of the several trainings that we gave that we thought would be really... um, It's a really great teaching and training that would be really great to share with all of you. Yeah. I would love for everybody as they go into 2023 to think a little bit bigger and think um, about their business as they, you know, kind of enjoy their family during the holidays or enjoy their loved ones, I should say, during the holidays. And then what they're going to step into, right? So this is really, this is our creative genius training keynote that we gave, as Jacqueline said, at our in-person mastermind, but it was for businesses that are anywhere from 300,000 all the way to multiple millions. And so it was fantastic. And I think that it will get you all in that kind of like inspirational mode of thinking potentially bigger and further in your business uh, while you're chilling during the holiday. (laughs) Because, you know, product bosses just chill. (laughs) <laughs> they can put one earbud in no, or I whatever know, it is, you know. I just think it's like the busy time of year. And here's, I think, now the Product Boss Mastermind, and it's actually launching again. So just to really quickly, if your ears are pinging because your business is over $300,000, so you're a multiple six-figure business all the way to multiple millions. We've had businesses in there, 15 million, 20 million. But right now, everyone's hovering between the high multi-six to m- multiple millions. If you're looking for a group, of industry-leading, multi-six and seven-figure product bosses that you want to connect with and thrive. We actually are taking applications right now for a super limited amount of time for the Product Boss Inner Circle Mastermind. Now, this is going to be a six-month mastermind. Um, It is application only. We're really excited about the applications that have already been coming in. We're really excited about the masterminders that are continuing with us. Um, And it's going to go from January through June. So if you've had a great year or maybe even a not so great year. Remember that these things are tax write-offs, right? So this is a way to, um, Mm -hmm. they're tax deductible, they're tax write-offs. These are the time of year is why I'm saying it. But we are really creating an incredible experience that's going to have two in-person retreats coming up, as well as support from Mina and myself and high-level trainings from experts. It's just going to be a beautiful experience within the inner circle. Yeah, for sure. And if you want, you can go straight there and check it out while you're listening to this episode. Uh, We really believe in the in-person bond, which is why there's two in-person retreats, but also in like learning and really um, growing yourself and investing in yourself and your personal growth as well that spills over into your business growth. So the um, website for that is 
theproductboss.com slash nope, theproductbossmastermind.com. Oh, theproductbossmastermind.com. So you can check that out. We would love to have you apply and um, be considered. And yeah. we're really excited about the incredible group. Now, again, you cannot apply, like the, when the spots are gone, there's only about 10 spots left. When the spots are gone, they're gone. And we are only registering people right now. And it'll be January through June. So meaning you can't pop in at any time. There's no time yeah. to think about it. It's now or yeah, you, now or it's not, not happening. Roll, it's not open doors. So you yes. won't be able to join in January, February, March, April, May, or June. <laughs> <laughs> so what I do want to say, and the, the reason that we created this Creative Genius presentation is because what we realize, and this is for a lot of you out there, a lot of times we forget what our creative genius was that helped us start our businesses in the first place. And now our masterminders are really far ahead. They're multi-six, multi-seven figures. They're growing teams. They're scaling. They're starting to look at their businesses and, and either they're the bottleneck and they need to get out of the way or things look different than the way they've always done it. And they need to shift and change and grow. And so we wanted to bring everybody back to their why, right? Like why their why and what their creative genius is that set, sets them apart in the first place. Yeah, for sure. I think that we get lost in it a little bit. And the thing is, we, we know this for sure, that what gets you here will not get you to the next level. Now, when you get to that level, though, you have to ground yourself in why you're doing things, what motivates you, what inspires you, what superpowers you have, what is your genius, you know? And I think that we lose track of that because it's like, I'm here, I've grown. And then before we can move forward, we have to see where we've been. And so creative genius is really about that of really grounding yourself and, you know, where did I start and how can I get to the next level? Because a lot of times you have to, you know, retrospectively look back in order to see, am I still on pace? and on track to to build the life that I actually want. And so that is really great. And it will take you to the next level of that. And we kind of walk you through, you know, different stories and, and, and you know, ways to really tap into where, where you used to be and where you are now. And that's really what the Creative Genius is about. Mm-hmm. It's also very grounding. It's a very mm-hmm. grounding lesson in figuring out where we are, where we came from, and how we can like hook back into that. I'll tell you at that mastermind experience, we had some masterminders that were burnt out, like mm-hmm. burnt out to the point of crying. This is because this is nothing to do with the mastermind. This has to do with the way that they built their businesses. And in the mastermind, they were coming in, one to look for community, one to say, hey, I'm not alone in this, right? To think bigger, but also to clean it up to yeah. figure out how to love on their business again, right? Because their business is theirs and they were able to create it. So I think this is just one of those beautiful steps that we took together in that room, in our room of masterminders, which is the beauty of in-person, like you said, and the beauty of being with people on the same track as you. That was really a big shift for her specifically. And then the entire experience. I mean, by the end of this, she was a changed human. So yeah. we hope that this inspires all of you. And send us a message over on Instagram. Let us know uh, if you kind of cued into this. And if you want to share a creative genius with us, come over to the DMs and share them with us. Yeah. And go to the productbossmastermind.com to be considered in the application um, if you are anywhere between 300,000 all the way to multiple millions, because we would love to go into the next year with you and from January to June. And I think it will change your life. Yep. So let's jump in. So this is Susie Weiss-Fishman and George Schaefer, and they are the co-founders of OPI Nail Lacquer. Anybody know OPI? Okay. So I actually have the privilege of being in the same family as Susie because my brother ended up marrying her daughter, Andrea. So um, that's how I'm close to knowing the story. And that's how when we started our podcast with barely any listeners, Susie came on the podcast and talked about her book, which is I'm Not Really a Waitress. Um, So Susie and George... Uh, her um, brother and sister-in-law. So Susie's sister, Mary George, uh, met in New York. They were uh, Hungarian uh, immigrants. Um, their parents were survivors of the Holocaust. Um, and they and when Susie came over, George's family in New York had, it's b- very marvelous, Miss Maisel, let me tell you. They had an apparel company. Susie was young, her sister was older, and she went and worked in the factories there. And then George's uncle in California had a dental product company which um, I'll, I'll be able to read it when it comes to the next slide, which what, that's actually what OPI stands for. And I'll, I'll kind of tell you what those words are. And so he went there 
And eventually the whole family moved west because, again, family values is something that they really align with and it's strong within their family. And Susie went and worked with George in the dental product company, and then (laughs) the rest is a billion-dollar story. So OPI nail polish. We know it. Um, Anyone here, like, what, what... What's something you know about OPI? Anyone? Bubble bath. Every time I go... Bubble bath? Well, the the color. The the name, right? The The name. name. The quality? Yeah. 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 Yep, they do. And quality, is that because you've worn it and it stays on longer, or is it a perceived value of quality? Do you know why you have that perceived value? Does anyone know, like, what has caused you to believe? Thank you. Nice star student over here. (laughs) (laughs) Are any of you in the same family as Susie? No. Have you read her book? No. But you know this in your guts, like this entire room of women from Canada and the U.S. with different backgrounds and experiences, different nail lengths, you know, gels, all the things. Even gels I ask for OPI because of quality, right? I'm assuming that it is. So here's the main point of this. Cody, which also bought, ended up buying 50% of um, Kylie Jenner's uh, company um, and Kim Kardashian's and all that. But back in 2010, it was about a $1 billion deal. Yes, my brother married up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this is Anyways, not, that's not the point. <laughs> this is not this is not from me knowing. I've never discussed money with her, but this is an article. And they were expected to announce that they closed on this deal of one billion dollars on a company that these two Jewish immigrants created, Holocaust survivors, from nothing, right? Literally had to come and start over and sold a company for a billion dollars. So how did these two young Jewish immigrants create a billion dollar brand? And it was their creative genius to think outside of the box, which you've all done. So from, this is from Susie's blog, From Dental to Nail Care, How OPI Became the Number One Beauty Brand Worldwide. So without a doubt, the launch of nail lacquer, do we see the difference in the wording there? It's not nail polish. Nail lacquer and nail color was the turning point of OPI. We had transitioned Auditorium Products Incorporated to OPI after realizing that the same components used to produce dentures were being bought up to be used for acrylic nails back in the 80s. Back in the 80s when people were making acrylic nails, they were buying from dental products. So after seeing an opportunity in the market, because they were in LA, okay, so that's the heart of Hollywood, heart of fashion, remember like rock and roll, 80s, you know, Rainbow Room, all that. After seeing an opportunity in the market, we transformed the business into a nail care company, creating products for salons that were doing acrylic nails. Our next big step was deciding to move into color. So if you listen to Susie on the podcast, she talked about Ventura Boulevard for my Valley Girl over here. Um, Susie would, they called it the rubber band special. They took the three products that people were buying to make acrylic nails. She rubber banded it together. She did not have good packaging. She did not have good packaging. She had a rubber band and three components. She walked Ventura Boulevard into all the little strip malls, walked into the higher end nail salons and said, I have this product, I wanna give it to you. It's above all for acrylic nails. I just want you to try it. I want you to try it on your customers. And then I'm gonna come back in two weeks and I want feedback. And she gave it to them for free. And she came back two weeks later. Again, this is, we're not DMing and texting each other. This is like phone calls and walking up to the stores. And she's talking to salon owners who are um, directly talking to customers and getting feedback. Well, people loved how long their nails stayed on. They loved the quality of the product. And they started saying, well, this is called OPI. So then customers started coming to the salons to ask for OPI. And for 20 years, we could only ever get OPI in a salon and you couldn't buy it. We couldn't go to the grocery store or like CVS and get nail polish. Um, And I think actually that transitioned when they sold the company for $1 billion, right? So she got, what did she get? She got feedback from customers. She went to decision makers. But she started with something basic. She started with a dental, you know, system. Right. Had the creative genius to think, how can I market this in a really special way to make it stand out in the market. And she did it with Creative Genius, which all of you have. But it was at its core, just a dental product. And she did not move into nail color yet. This was just the acrylics. 
Okay, so all of you that are like, I need to make this and I need to make that and I need to do all things. She started with just the acrylic component wrapped in a rubber band. She called it like the rubber band special. And so she said, I've always been acutely aware of beauty and especially the role that was played by color. Whether it was viewed in fashion, nature, or art, moving into color felt like the next best move. And I was excited to use my instinctual eye. So this is just her creative genius. When, when we began creating nail lacquer, we saw that there was a very limited color palette available to women. For limited colors that were available, the names were formula, formulaic and unmemorable, like red, number two. Perfect example, Joy and Jane, named, they have their pacifier company, and they were calling it navy or sand for colors for pacifier. And then Mina said, how about blueberry and oatmeal? Simple. Mm -hmm. They had the genius of the product, but then it came down to the marketing, the naming, the, the creative part that makes you stand out. Because sometimes this beautiful genius product may only make it so far until you have to take it to another level. We okay. sold so many more navy pacifiers since it became blueberry, by the way. Blueberry. Mm -hmm. Simple, right? She went from nail polish to nail lacquer. She wanted to elevate it. She went to salons. She wanted to elevate it. She said, it's still red, but instead of calling it red number two, I'm going to call it, I'm not really a waitress. Okay. So we decided it was time to rebrand the category in a big way. We wanted women everywhere to find nail color approachable, to have choices in a color that reflected their mood and style, and to feel more connected to the process. That's when we launched our first 30 colors, not 100 million, 30 colors. Okay. And um, with catchy and playful names like Coney Island Cotton Candy, uh, Malaga Wine, and Kyoto Pearl, we started to get women's attention and connect with them. It brought on two important things for the brand, consumer awareness and consumer loyalty on a global scale. So this is these are two main points that we're gonna talk about. Consumer awareness, which is customer acquisition, and consumer loyalty, which is customer retention, right? Like getting them to buy more from you. Getting them to buy more dome backs, right? They buy it once, how do we get them to buy more? So this was definitely inspired by um, you as well. So. We changed the whole nail, uh, let's see, I skipped some, but they made color more exciting and memorable from sand to oatmeal. They could choose from not only reds and pinks, because remember, we're coming in for the 80s, or 70s, you know, there wasn't, there weren't all the colors and women didn't express themselves, but they wanted to in their nails. Let's look at her nails, TikTok influencer over here, <laughs> right? Um, and so she wanted to offer a shade for everyone and to match any look or outfit. Women began going to their salons asking for their favorite OPI shades by name, as Joy gave us right there, right? I used to wear pinking of you. Yep. Cajun, Cajun shrimp. Cajun shrimp. <laughs> Lincoln Park After Dark was also one of my favorites, right? And they asked for shades by name before long OPI took off and we wanted to make women feel good, right? So they changed the whole nail care category for the better. We continue to add new beautiful shades every season inspired for, by everything from travel to celebrities, from film and TV. And with this, we were able to continue to excite the consumer and solidify OPI's position as the number one professional nail brand. Do you think when her mom survived the Holocaust, her husband and son went one way, never came back? Mom went another way and ended up in America. Do you think that they ever knew that these two immigrants were gonna do what they did? No. And this room of strangers can name names of their brand, okay? So I know this is big, but it's nail polish. It's not changing the world. So each of you might think, oh, okay, I just sell, you know, uh, candles or soap bottles or, or hat racks, you know, that kind of thing. And you might think I'm not changing the world, but you're influencing the world in what you've created. When Susie sold the company, um, she was still the creative genius in the brand. She still did the naming. She was still on board with the company and she still is a creative consultant. Now this red color, she wanted to find a color red that all women could wear no matter the shade of their skin and feel comfortable in. And she called it, I'm not really a waitress and it's their number one selling um, color. And it was because in Los Angeles, as I call them slashers, because I'm married to an actor, mm -hmm. they're um, actors slash waiters, right? So a waitress would say, I'm not really a waitress, I'm an actress, I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter, I'm a whatever. So that's what, that did it. So the, what's the guy's creative genius? They only sold to high-end nail salons for two decades, okay, for all of you that want to branch out and do things really fast and really quick. I just want you to see how they really stayed strong with their, their choices. They created strong relationships to salon owners and took feedback. They changed the naming from polish to lacquer. 
They changed the naming from numbers to interesting names like I'm Not Really a Waitress for red polish every woman could wear, which was their bestseller. Still sells today. They co-branded with Hollywood, like 007 was a big brand that they went into. And they did other collabs like Disney, Coca-Cola, Xbox. They're still doing it. This is part of, there's no other nail polish company out there that does this kind of thing, right? So we want you now to think back to why you started your business. Was there a gap in the market? Was there a need that you had, that you had? Did, was there a need that someone you knew had, right? So caramel that doesn't break your teeth, right? Hat racks that don't look ugly, nutritional health, cookies that are just awesome, but you know. And we're all eating a snack right now. <laughs> <laughs> we have 10 pounds of cookies to share with you uh, in the coming time. Um, are you an artist that you wanted to share your art with the world? Were you an expert at something? Did you want to change lives? Was it a twist on something already in the market? I created Cuffs Couture. It was a wrist wallet. There are wrist wallets out there, hideous. I am not a kind of person that needs a big bag. I don't have all the things in the bag. I just want my keys and my credit card, easy peasy. So it wasn't for everyone. And Cuffs was for me and that's my party days and I wanted to go out and I hated like, what do you do with your bag when you're dancing? It's on your shoulder, it's super annoying. You don't want to leave it because someone could take it. So I was like, and I didn't wear pockets, I was wearing mini skirts, you know, good old days. So I had the stuff I needed and on my wrist. So there was this need that I had, but I made a change onto something that already existed. We don't have to be brand new. We don't have to create something new. I always say, this is what I've told my clients all these years is, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you just have to redesign it, okay? Um, okay, so now, so okay, let's just go back to this really fast. Think back to why you started your business. Anyone wanna share? why they started their business? Because I was cheap. Because you were cheap for what? So um, I do Fusion by Design collars, so I do the really blinged out, you know, bougie dog collars. And at the time, um, there was nobody in Canada that did them, so it meant buying from a couple of smaller businesses in the state, but they were really, really expensive, especially after we put in the exchange rate. So I already knew how to leather craft. It had been a hobby of mine. And I was like, well, this can't be that hard. And uh, so I started making collars for my own dogs because I was too cheap to buy them from somebody else. And before you know it, I had friends asking me to do collars for them. And it just kind of grew from started. there. Started. So you yeah. saw a gap in the market. Well, so, I need for myself. I, I wanted pretty collars right. for my own collar, for my own dogs, and there was just nothing available. So yeah. I decided to make it myself. I think that's part of a creative genius, right? We all see something we're trying to, oftentimes it is having to do with ourselves, right? Because we care most about our own problems. It's just the same as the consumer. And so you saw, did see a gap in the market. I want you all to really think about what made you start a business. You know, sometimes it is, it would be very rare that the idea has not come out already, you know? So like a candle company, for example, right? How can you put a spin on it? But there was still a gap in the market, right? I'm a labels company. Labels have done been done before. But how would, I saw a gap in the market and I was like, okay, I know that I'm not the only one and I'm not the smartest one and I'm not probably the most talented one but I'm the one who's going to go for it right now in the way that I'm doing it. Yeah, so and that's how we always yourself. reference candle companies, just a side note, because it's something that's basic and people don't always see it as a necessity, right? And so when I say basic, not a basic, but people don't see it as a necessity all the time. So it's a simple way of looking at something that's like, it's actually a bit of a luxury. It's something that delights you, but it's not something that you absolutely have to have, right? So that's how we kind of use that. So one more person want to share why they started? Okay, candle company. I'll share it. So I have two businesses, which is kind of confusing. So I started Cozy, my candle brand first, and I started to run into a problem. So I think that was like a need that I personally had. So I was focused on um, environmentally friendly, all biodegradable or reusable parts for my candles. And I, at the time, was buying all my stuff from Wood & Co., which is like a big company out in Long Beach, I believe. And they would run out of wax all the time. I couldn't get it. They were only, one of the only suppliers that carry these like luxury coconut waxes. Um, so I just decided to go like directly to the manufacturer for myself because I knew I would be covered. But at this point, you know, a couple months in, <coughs> I started to make friends with other candle makers, you know, just, you know, just learning and sharing and things like that. And different <coughs> guys would just say, hey, um, we saw you had a picture of a palette. Like, do you have any extra that like I could just buy off of you? And I was like, 
I mean, I'm not going to use all these 1,800 pounds like today, so sure. And I would get like Venmos through my phone and like text messages and like PayPal requests. And it was like very unmanageable. My fiance was like, well, why don't you just like start a boutique candle supply business just for like your friends? So it's like more legit and you like, you know, everything's like on paper. So I started the supply business and that took off way faster than in my candle, my DTC candle brand, because there was no luxury supplier in Texas, even in central part of the country. Candle production was like through the roof because everyone's at home doing self care. Um, and that's kind of like how it was born was literally just a need for me, a need for other people. And no one in Texas was doing what I did. And yeah. now three other companies have started since I started, but they've all gone out of business already. So I'm still here. Yeah. But yeah, that's why we started. Amazing. And so Lindsay, we were a little bit inspired by you on this one because Lindsay, um, with her fabric company, we hit like two, three million in 2020. 2.7. 2.7 million in 2020 selling woven fabrics because people were making their own masks, right? But that wasn't, Lindsay was doing knits online. That was your main reason for doing it. And then she met a need in the market. What happened with 2020 and 2021 and now that COVID, what? You know, um, so people stopped buying wovens from her. And now the idea is, is like why she started, but then there's this drop because the people who came to her for one thing, there was a specific global need has shifted. Right, so we're gonna kind of help with that a little bit. Okay, so this is why you started. Now think back to how you initially took off. Okay, so with Cups Couture, I worked for a celebrity. I was friends with celebrities. Um, I had access, I partied with them. And so I was like, hey, you know, Audrina Patridge, Jamie Presley, put my cup on, let me snap a pic. I was able to do it. I was friends with people who were impressed. Um, like PR, uh, this was all pre-social media sort of thing. and. Um, so, and then I was able, I understood PR, I understood how to call publicists, and a publicist ended up getting me into People Magazine using the photos that I had of these celebrities, and that took off because I had had my business for a couple months, and it was like, wah, wah, two friends ordered, right? And then we got into People Magazine during Christmas, and it just was a game changer. So for me, I initially took off because I was lucky that I had, we call it... Um, Unfair advantage. Your unfair advantage. So a lot of us don't claim our unfair advantages because we're like, oh, that's just because this, or we almost shift it a little bit too. Like, oh, those people got on Instagram at the right time. Those people got on to um, Amazon at the right time. And there is a right timing to things and confirmed. So you need to claim what that is. So there is reasons and it's timing that certain brands can take off right? But it comes down to the combination of the person too. So was there an invention that you came out with that was needed during the time? Was there press that hit that you had access to, you know, in a time of celebrity? Because now you would not be able to recreate that. Was there, you know, were you first to market? Was Were you in the right time or the right place? Was there a collaboration that happened that really blew you up? This happened for... Um, like some drama happened even with a Bengals company that we were working with that somebody knocked her off and her her um, audience, and her, yeah, her customers and fans stood up for her and ended up buying a whole bunch. So what seemed to be like almost like lightning Instagram striking. Instagram war on the world. Yes. World. So Instagram war ended up being very great for her. You know, it could be also people have won awards. Carrie is a good example of that, right? She's won. Okay, here it goes. Indigenous. No, no. Indigenous. No. You can say the word. Indigenous. Yeah, indigenous. <laughs> She's won that award, right? And so she can take it as far as she can take it. And you do need to push into things that give you that momentum. They send you a badge. We have no idea how to. But the thing is, that's your creative genius, right? There's, You have to be able to take it where you need to take it. There's networks or connections. Jacqueline was in Hollywood. Right, she's in. She had access to people that nobody, that I and Iowa would never. Um, event in time, pandemic, social justice movement. Yeah. This is Lindsay. So while we think that we got somewhere, it is everybody's same story. So do you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, and I want to say though, Mina was on Little Labels, was first Prime Day ever. Yeah, so that's on the next slide. Okay, but real quick, really quick though, some of you in your brains right now are saying, mm, "I missed it too late." Right? Anyone feeling that? Like there was something, no? Okay, because for example, TikTok took off in 2020. I started an account then. 
Did I continue it? No. Three years later, you're taking off on TikTok, right? But I had had a TikTok for a year before. Before it took off. It took off. Amazon's been around. You got on. You got on. And that's shifted your entire business, right? So it's never too late. But there's reasons you initially took off. Yeah. As the product class has grown, Mina and I have gone from being intensely connected and always knowing what the other is doing in business to building out a team and learning how to layer in different levels of communication among all the different team members. We've learned from experience that when there's a communication breakdown between the different roles of the business, the customers are the ones who may suffer the most. And that's not what we want at all. Nope, not at all. We prioritize and strongly value great customer experiences from start to finish every time. Creating great customer experiences starts with having a full picture. And having the full picture starts with having teams that are connected. HubSpot helps your team stay and feel connected. They can finish each other's sentences, sales pitches. Yep, it's that kind of connected. Yes, and the HubSpot CRM platform is carefully crafted from the ground up designed to unite your data, apps, and teams in a single, easy-to-use system. So instead of wasting valuable time tracking down information, your teams can spend their time having conversations where it matters most with your customers. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. So what are your unfair advantages? We kind of were talking about that. So OPI was dental products and connections to Hollywood and tastemakers. For myself, I had access to celebrities in PR and Mina. I had er- I was an early seller on Amazon and I hit the first Prime Day. Also, I was a graphic designer. Speed of implementation for me was very quick, meaning I didn't have to hire a designer. I didn't have to understand also my commercial printing days. So all those hours that I'd be making annual reports that I was like despising that version of my life ended up here wild, right? Where it ended up where I ended up with little labels. She ended up with Cuffs Couture and here we are. But so you don't see in the beginning and you don't even understand the skill sets that you're learning how to do. A lot of this is learned, just like learning how to negotiate, learning how to hire, learning how to do graphic design. You don't know where that's going to end up. And then learning my, I actually was not a good graphic designer. I was good enough to be hireable so much that I was such a good team player. I actually had a advertising degree as well as psychology and I had my MBA. I self-taught myself graphic design. The whole time I had imposter syndrome. I always thought I'm not good enough. I'm not an actual designer. I taught myself this. How many of us think that way? Because we were like, we don't understand numbers or we don't have this or we don't have that. But the thing is I got into banks. I got into car dealerships property management. I got into ad agencies and I would do their overflow work. You know why? Because I figured it out and I was willing to understand the process the whole way through. So my unfair advantage was that I understood commercial printing, that I would go to the presses and sign off on projects, but I was able to work with the entire project, which is, you can kind of see that's my superpower, right? I can see the big picture as well as the small details. So I learned that through commercial printing. I would understand how something was designed. I wasn't just a graphic designer. And I, I had like illustrators and copywriters. And then at the end of it, they would have this really produced elaborate annual report and all kinds of things. And so I used those advantages that were, that I had, but it wasn't because I was the most talented. It was because I was the most resourceful and I really leaned into the things I was good at. So I had this awareness yesterday because this is a trip for us too that you're all here. Let me just, you know, this is a reflected thing for us. And it's like, I actually never realized that Cuffs Couture brought me here. Back then I was like, I made money. I was selling globally. We're in 60 stores or no, yeah, 60 stores uh, globally. Music awards. Oh, Carrie Underwood wore us. Like you could watch one of her videos around the country music awards, like all sorts of awesome things, right? (laughs) Really cool things that we did. Cut back when I worked for the celebrity, Christy Teigen was our model at 18 where we were trying to track that girl down. We could not even find her. She was like such a party girl. And now look at Christy, right? So, but the, the things that you didn't realize that I worked for celebrity, I had access. We had Robin Thicke perform over a pool we built at a hotel 
in Hollywood before Robin Thicke was Robin Thicke, right? So these things that then I took and I put into Cuffs when I had my own brand. And then Cuffs, I met her because I wanted to get rid of Cuffs. And I was like, can I liquidate it on Amazon? And she's like, no, don't do it. And then we bonded here. Then four years later, at 37, we started the product boss. Never, ever did I ever think, I only wanted to make $100,000. Didn't know I was going to be a millionaire, right? Mm -hmm. So those unfair advantages stack on top of themselves. And so each of you, some of you feel lost right now because you, you're you forgetting where you started. And we want, this is this whole time is going to be about getting you back and reflecting because where you started has gotten you to where you are today. So your secret sauce. This is how you stand out in a crowded market with your brand voice and messaging. It doesn't have to do with pricing or discounting. It has to do with marketing and standing out to your customer. Blueberry versus navy, right? Yeah. I'm not really a waitress versus red number two. Because people who don't have a creative bone in their body will automatically go to pricing. It is a chase to the bottom. People who are good at marketing or good at understanding business, they go with, I need to either tweak my audience or I need to tweak my marketing. It's not about pricing because you can sell $100,000 cars to, to, you know, like people have a perceived value. Right. It has to do with how it's marketed to and who it's marketed to. So as long as you line those up, you don't even have to be the most special, right? So for example, you just have to know that there's an, a customer out there for you and market to them specifically on what they need from you. Yeah. So how does your product meet a need, want, or desire? And does it solve a problem? This helps you figure out the logical versus psychological reasons they're gonna buy. But I'd love for somebody here um, to share, does your problem meet a need, want, or desire or solve a problem? Go ahead. Yeah, so our product came out of um, a need we had and it solved the problem. Again, it, going back to your point, we did not invent the pacifier. But what we did is we tweaked it and we made a pacifier to fill a gap in the market because there were women like my sister and I, um, so we designed a pacifier that's geared toward breastfed babies. It's twice as soft, it mimics breastfeeding movement when a baby uses it. And what we realized was there was all these breastfed babies and we would go on like it was a need we had, went on to forums, moms were like crying emojis, why I just need to replicate a boob on a pacifier, like I just need a break. And we were like, this is a real big pain point. It wasn't an easy thing because we had to patent the technology and you know, you could have, you know, and these were the steps to get there. But what we realized was two moms could do this. We didn't have to be doctors. We didn't have to be feeding professionals. We were two moms with a real legitimate need. And so, whereas we didn't know how to get it done, my background being in television production, I worked in reality and documentary TV for an LA based production firm in Chicago for a long time. And so I might not have had all the answers, but I was resourceful, I knew how to get answers. Right. So I don't know how to prototype silicone, but I bet you I'll find somebody who can, right? And um, it was in that, that we began to realize, okay, this can be done. Like, we are literally inventing a pacifier. That's weird, like nobody's doing it. We're running heating and cooling business, but you know what? We'll just be weird and crazy together and we'll bounce these ideas out of each other. And then seven years later, we were crazy enough to put it on Shopify and people bought it. You know? Right, but here's where I wanna go. There's logical. There, That was the logical reason that you created it. We've all seen products that are out there that are logical. Those green pacifiers, I forget the name of them, but they were Susie. Mm -hmm. And they give them the NICU and all that. Okay, there's logical reasons. But now let's talk about your secret sauce. Because if you came out a year ago with just a pacifier, here's the pacifier, represents suppressed. Great, cool, thank you, I need it, but why are they all buying it? How did you get to a million dollar business? So how did you stand out? What was your design, your story? I know it's an invention, yeah. but if you follow Niniko, their photos are beautiful. What else did you do that was creative? Mm -hmm. What was the creative stuff you did that you think stood, stood out? I think the creative stuff we did is we really, we knew that we wanted to be a brand that wasn't going to be baby cute. We wanted to appeal to moms. Okay. It like it was to reach into like an emotional thing to say, we understand that everybody's always like baby products. What does my baby need? But no mom, you need this because this is the break that you need. So you don't have to worry about oral dysfunction. You don't have to worry about nipple confusion, that you can get a break and that, you know, your significant other can watch the baby and you can take a shower. You can leave. 
we are trying to have an emotional tie to say, you're now part of this family where we understand and we're giving you a break, right? Yeah. So um, we hear from moms who have, um, you know, adopted children or babies who come out of the NICU that are able to successfully breastfeed because this device helped them learn how to properly move their oral muscles. And did you sh- do you share those stories? We do. Yeah. We play into that. Constantly sharing testimonials, pictures, real life Right. Stories. So it's the emotional mm-hmm. versus the psychological. And when you lean into it's with our products, it, even though it's me, it's uh-huh. very similar because we do the same thing because we cater to allergies. Right. Pets with allergies that need that unique protein or overweight pets. Yeah. I was paying $7 a day to give my dog yeah. shots with allergies. Exactly what I was going to say, right? So when you lean into emotions and psychological reasons that people buy, if you're able to do that for them, price does not matter. So if you have two binkies in front of you, two pacifiers, and they're the same price, but one of them's talking to the emotional need and the hardship and the, the feeling like I'm a good mom, but I can still step away and take a shower, Right, and one is just f- focuses on the features. This is silicone, um, however many yeah. diameters, you know, blah blah blah. Then you're probably going to go with you. You're not probably. You're a hundred percent, actually ninety nine point nine percent, more likely to go with the psychological one because in that case you're buying something different. You're buying that that piece of you. There was a study that was done by Gerald something. I knew his first name was Gerald, but um, he was a neurologist that, we have this all in the accelerator, you all have access to it, but people who were damaged in a certain part of their brain that um, couldn't, the part that has to do with emotions, when those that piece was damaged, they were unable to make purchasing decisions. They were unable to make decisions because that's how much people lean into the purchasing decision of the emotion. They can't even make a decision without the emotion part of it, right? So when we're curious about how to grow our brands, when we're feeling stuck, a lot of times we're like, should I discount it? right? Like, should I put it on sale? Should I, we're racing to the bottom on pricing versus leaning into the secret sauce, leaning into the emotional connection. For fabric, the connection is, is why? Like we were talking, we were really trying to break down fabric and, and, you know, Ellen does also like, um, you know, supplies online. Well, what's the reason? I live in a small town. I can't find what I need at my local shop. In my brain, I know what I want, but I can't find it at Joann's or Michael's or wherever I'm going to buy my fabric. Um, so I want to have more access to more things. To create like a beautiful quilt. Like the motion part is I want to create something, but I don't have access. So I have to go online and that's my friction point. There's a friction, right? So then how do you make them feel good about their choices? How do you create ease? Like it's all the stuff around it because why is there like a fabric company, like why your fabric company and not someone else's, right? And there's that connection to it. So on your sheet, there is your creative genius, right? It got you here. So if you haven't done it already, what made you create your products? What market gap did you see? What things pushed you forward and set you apart? And how will you keep innovating? So sometimes it's hard when we're looking at numbers and we're like, I almost made 3 million and now I feel like I'm struggling because I don't have this part, but there was a reason they bought from you in the first place. And it's more than you dancing like a unicorn, right? Like there's like more things, but that's part of it. So I know a lot of people do. So how do you keep innovating, right? There will always be shifts. Facebook ads fail. There will always be shifts. Right, Shopify is not converting. Instagram no longer works organically. There's a pandemic and you can't do in person. People are knocking you off on on Amazon. People are knocking off on Sheen, right? Megan in the group, like she was knocked off. Um, There's wars. There could be a recession coming. Even so, I don't want any of you to freak out because the thing is, is that there will always be shifts. There will always be things changing. And our goal is to keep innovating 37 and I don't remember, you were like 39 when we started this, we innovated. We didn't know. We took all of these things that we had from our, you know, almost 20 years working and created where we are today. So we want you to always go back to your creative genius. So if you're writing it down and you're realizing what your creative genius is, I want you to tap back into that. This is the thing that we lose when we're in the spin and when we're... So so I'm not sure, Danielle, for you, you had mentioned certain words when you were talking about how you had created 
you wanted something bougie that was crafted but through leather craft. Mm -hmm. And so were people buying leather craft before, yes. for example? So, you know. There was already, even, like if, even in this space, there was already probably you know, five, six, seven, eight, twelve. But probably seven. not in the way that you did it. So right? let me ask you a question. Was your leather brown leather? Yeah. It was just brown? Brown, black, standard. Anything on it? Uh, yeah, right off the bat, I was doing the crystals on it. Okay, crystals. Yeah. And now you've launched a colorful leather line. Yes. And people are buying? Yes. Okay, so she's trying to figure out a way, these really, really expensive $300 colors, 400 600 Okay, I keep it. Which is funny because you're like, anywhere, I was looking anywhere from three to six hundred easy. Because what's funny is you started your business because it, it was too expensive to I buy don't. collars, <laughs> but she sells six hundred dollar collars. I will say though, it took, it took me a really, really long time to get to that price point. So totally, but I'm just saying it wasn't a cheap. You weren't I like, would, I'm gonna I would create buy a cheap my collars at my price right, right now. I'll right. That. So she's doing color. So part of and and you saw the bag I had yesterday, like the bright colors, like the shoes I was wearing. This is like a newer brand that I'm seeing in Nordstrom's all the time, and you can identify it from color mm -hmm. from a million miles away. And that's kind of what we're talking about. So <laughs> Lululemon had a wrist wallet very similar to the one I created in Lululemon Luan fabric that people wore. And I checked it out. I checked out there was no patent, and I went and created it, and I put really cute things on it, and I made them in really pretty fabrics. I always say this. I've started over a 1,000 fashion brands, okay? Like, I, nobody is new in their idea, and it always happens around the same time. So when men were starting to make, like, really fancy um, swimwear, like, men didn't, it was always, like, Billabong and all that. And then at some point, then, like, Belibber Quinn and these really high-end $150, $300, $500 men's board shorts were coming out. I, I would always have like six, seven, eight people come to me that wanted to do that. When sports, when yoga clothes, kind of Lululemons, because they started in Canada, I knew them from way back in the day. And then when that started trending in the US and all of a sudden everybody wanted to make really fancy yoga clothes, things go in trends. Just the consciousness, we don't realize it, okay? Yeah. So for you, I, it's okay. That's, that's, that's an okay internal story, but we all have seen a need in the market and we don't reinvent the wheel. The wheel yeah. is the wheel. We redesign it's it. It's kind of like Danielle's story where she started off, I did this because I'm cheap. Is that true though? It's probably true to a certain point, but you still did it. So for example, there's another brand that was out on Amazon before I started, something like Hulums or something, but their whole thing was hulums, like they were owls. So it was labels that had owls on them. <laughs> and so I took a, that general idea, theirs sealed differently, it was different. But I was like, it clicked for me. Now, somebody else could have looked at that and it would click for them differently. Mm -hmm. So I think that for all of us, thinking that we didn't do anything special enough might be what you all need to overcome here. You all have certain advantages. You all have certain skill sets. There is nobody that will bring something to the market in the exact same way that you do. Unless they're straight up knocking you off. Yeah, unless they're straight up knocking you off. Yeah. But even then, they don't know what you're going to be thinking. And they so also can don't still have yeah. the advantage, right? Like, yeah. I actually have a neighbor that does what we do. She coaches product businesses, but she coaches beauty. And I remember one day she spun out and she's like, you see, this person's coaching beauty uh, product business now and this person, she's sending me all these people. And we're ahead of her in the game, but I was like, kind of need you to stop because I don't need to spin out. And second, no one's going to have our voice or approach to it. They just cannot duplicate it. You all listen to many podcasts. It's fine. Some people think my voice is really annoying. I've gotten those reviews, they right? never said that. Oh, when we went viral on Instagram, oh, let me tell you. Oh, but People have horrible things to say. But you have... You have the right customers and you don't, right? And so the idea is, is like how, your secret sauce, the things that you're bringing to it, your spin on it, whether it's the thing for you can really like, maybe I don't see that connection anymore of like sports, kids, backpacks, right? right. Mm -hmm. But you may have gone, moved on from there because there are other blanket companies. So it might be, and I keep referring to big blanket. If anyone's seen it, it is a 10 foot by 10 foot blanket, 10 foot by 10 foot. Nobody oh. needs a 10 foot by 10 foot blanket. But it's like a family blanket, right? So for them, their secret sauce is that they are big. I can just say that in general, right? They'll cover you. But that, you yeah. <laughs> but, now, but that is a, um, a logical problem solve, the size of the blanket. So for you, for example, uh, the psychological version of that is it's a big blanket that you can wrap around you, but it's big enough and thin enough and lightweight enough that you can fold it and put it into a backpack. 
Because or take it on a picnic or put it in the back of your car yeah. or take it to baseball practice, right? Those connections and the need for it. Or snuggling while your kids are young. You all snuggle up when they're still cuddling with you, mm-hmm. right? Like, So those are the emotional, the psychological versus the this is a blanket. It's a queen size blanket. It's lightweight. Blankets have been done before. Big blankets yeah, has a seven foot two man with this blanket, a gigantic dog with this blanket, right? So they're showing they have these hooks onto things that for people's brains are like, wow, that is a giant man on a giant blanket. Mm-hmm. Sumo wrestler. Sumo wrestler. Yeah, they have a sumo wrestler wrapped in this blanket. So they're going, and this is what we're going to do tomorrow with innovation. But they're talk. It's more than it's a ten foot by ten foot blanket. That will cover all of you on a couch, okay? Now, how much would a mom pay in order to solve that problem for all their kid? All the money. All, yeah. of dollars. all, all the, the money, money, right? You don't even think about the money. You don't. Yeah, exactly. And that's what was really great. That is the psychological. So we could say it's weighted. Mm-hmm. That is a, um, what was the word we used? Um, a, a function of the blanket. Yeah. But what's the psychological? Yeah. Just like the dogs have thunder coats. Oh my God. People have been dressing their dogs for generations till somebody marketed and said, this is the thunder shirt or the thunder coat, you know, then it was just done in a different voice. And if someone made them cuter than the gray wrap one that I have, I would buy it because my dog cannot, the lightning storms yesterday in New Jersey, my dog lost his mind. Anyone, anyone else just in the, in the last couple of minutes of this, anyone else that hasn't shared yet that wants to say anything about this specifically? I'll tell you about Smash Cookies real quick. Yes, please. Okay. Cause it's, you know, it's kind of weird. So I grew up in Colorado but I live in um, Arkansas now. So growing up, I had a lot of friends who were Mormon. And so when we all dispersed, a lot of people went back to Utah and Idaho and all of those places. So we keep in touch. And in these areas, and like Mormon mommy bloggers are a thing, um, and I follow all of them, I don't know why, but um, they're really into these like soda shops like Swig and some other places that have these cookies that look like they've been smashed with icing on top and they look delicious. And there was nothing like that in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my bakery and I was like trying to come up with new products that I could offer, I was like, I'm gonna create a cookie that I smash and cover in buttercream. And I did, and I I was like, what do I call it? I'll call it a smash cookie because I smash it. And so it was like this totally brand new unique product because it takes a long time for anything to get to Arkansas. So it's like totally innovative locally. And then when the pandemic hit and I just started randomly sending boxes of these things to celebrities and podcasters, because I was like, someone eat my cookies and talk about it, please. (laughs) Um, It was really interesting because it's like my special sauce is that I'm a woman with a business in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what, like, so I was listening these podcasters like promote me and I was listening to one of the podcasts and they promoted me and he always says yeah she's this girl who started this bakery in Arkansas and like people think that that's cool (laughs) they're still listening to who let the dogs out in Arkansas it's like this novel concept that like a woman owns a or a girl a girl bakery in Arkansas and ships cookies that are really, because they're cookies. Yeah. Lots of people make really delicious cookies. But Smash, right? She came up, I I know wording, and we're talking a lot about wording, but wording is an important part of this. Mm -hmm. Kimberly dealt with this by calling on swaddle blankets and then going out for the first time after the pandemic, and these asses were like, swaddle blankets? And it was like, okay, maybe they're not your right customer, or maybe we've kind of moved past that, or maybe there's not the connection on Swaddle. Smash so clearly says to you what it is, and then when we work together, we're like, how do you up-level the Smash Kiki? How do you make it fun? How do you make it something people talk about, right? Um, Hat Rack's reinvented. I know you guys keep trying to think about a new product to launch, but there's variations on what you've created, and needs, you haven't even scratched the surface, right, of what you're all doing. So think about Susie Weiss Fishman and George they they did not, they probably got people coming to them saying CVS or Target can I sell your nail polish and they kept to we're going to sell to salons we want to be named like we want people to say I want go ahead it's fine. are you about to eat a cookie <laughs> 
triggered it, right? Yeah. That that was a that's an that's emotional the power of influence, right there. That's an emotional response. We're talking about cookies with buttercream. She shows it. She shows the making. She shows the buttercream. It's the psychological, not the these are three dollar cookies that yeah. I make out of Arkansas or whatever price you price them at, right? Can it's I say something yeah. About that? yeah. Our rabbit ears did the same thing. So we dehydrate our rabbit ears for the pets, and it's one of our treats. It is one of my most popular selling items, and I charge the most for it. Right. Because of the fur on, because we don't, we don't go and pick rendered product and clean it and make it. We make it. And and there's a difference. So they want that. They pay a premium. I charge $30 a bag and they maybe get eight years. Shut up. I'm not <laughs> and, and I can't keep them in stock. And it's all because of the negative. I have on Instagram and Facebook, my marketing team let them go negative because every negative person somebody else will comment back on that negative person say, do you know the benefits for your dog with this? Do you see the difference in these treats versus those treats? I'd buy these a hundred times over this. Mm-hmm. And and we just let them go wild. And, and I'm like, I don't even respond. Yeah. I just, yeah. like, okay. And yeah. that negativity or that girl comment is probably boosting. <laughs> but even the swaddle thing. Yeah. I want to go to the swaddle thing really quickly because Kimberly, she called it a swaddle blanket for adults. She probably could have called it a swaddle blanket for teenagers, let's just say. There is nobody that would laugh at that comment if they were having to figure out how to soothe their autistic child who's now a teenager. Nobody. Or themselves, that's right. Right. They don't understand it. Just like the rabbit thing. There is nobody that would find that, like, repulsive or something if they actually knew the... If they were using it for their dog and had a problem they had to solve, yeah. right? Like it's a natural dewormer, right? Yeah. So that's why our products stand out. So there's the uses. So there's the reasons, yeah. and then there's the psychological. There is a customer that's going to resonate with the psychological and the reasons, and those are your customers. It's not the customer that tells you your bottles are too expensive, your pacifiers are too expensive, your candles are too expensive, your blanket is, you raised your prices on your blanket and they're too expensive, if you hear me shouting your name out over there. (laughs) Because we oftentimes try and cut our prices, but we're not connecting with the right customer. Thank you for being here and listening all the way through the Product Boss Podcast. If you love our show and it has helped you in any way in your business, would you mind doing two things for us? Subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode and leave us a review. Reviews help other product entrepreneurs know that this is the place to be to grow their businesses and realize that they're not alone. And we know that you all know that a five-star and honest review helps you sell more products to more people. So you know that your reviews help us reach more listeners around the world. Remember, what we give is what we receive, and we are all about helping each other in the Product Boss community. We are all in this together. We would be so appreciative of you if you could take the time right now to subscribe, leave a review, and even share this episode on social or someone you know so we can impact more lives. And remember, subscribing means that you will get notified each time we release a new episode so you never miss a thing. You have helped us grow and climb into the top 10 of all marketing podcasts and together we can keep climbing. Thank you, friends. And remember, there is room at the top for all of us.